nobody's going to try and leave. You know what this government does to people. You become a QR code in here. It feels genuinely dystopian. Hey everyone, Azil here. Really quick before this video starts, I now have a second channel where I do stuff having to do with programming and AI. If you are at all interested in that stuff, I already have a video up on there where I used the incel forums to train a chatbot to finish sentences like an incel. So if you're at all interested, go ahead and check it out. It's in the description. Other than that, on to the video. The reason I am in China is because, well, technically I'm, I can't tell you that much, but stuff with uh, foreign affairs. So you can't tell me why you're in China, but you are something to do with foreign affairs, right? That's what you said? My family is because I'm still technically a minor. And so the, the government goes, hey, you got to follow these people. As you will come to find out, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of the government. Um, so I personally don't work for them. Ah, yeah, fair enough. So we got stationed here during 2020. We got sent here like during the pandemic, which was really interesting to like, you know, move during, especially to China, which is like, you know, the the place. Uh, but thankfully, actually, where I live, Shanghai, there, would, there was almost no cases at that time. It had pretty much moved east to west all the way into the U.S. already. And so by the time we got here, it was pretty much fine. But we still had to do like multiple weeks of quarantine and that kind of stuff. Um, moving here was, you know, a, a pretty major culture shock, especially in terms of, I guess, what stuck out to me the most is surveillance. Everything is watching you all the time, everywhere, no matter what. It's an interesting phenomenon. I remember when we when we got here, we got a briefing, and they go, yeah, everything is recording you all the time. Uh, my phone, which is like right over there, as I've been told, supposedly, the camera and microphone are always on, even if it says it isn't. Wow. Either that's because it actually is, or it's because you got to pretend it is in order to, well, not pretend, but you got to act like it is in order to keep like OPSEC. But, you know, it's definitely unnerving to know you're always being watched. It's an interesting example of the human condition, a fairly disturbing example of the human condition that we just adapted to it eventually. Mm. The fact that, you know, this can happen and then you are eventually like, yeah, it's normal that my phone is recording me all the time is, you know, it's a strange feeling. Yeah, I can't imagine as a Westerner what it would be like to have someone paying attention all the time. I mean, we've got the CIA and they're not the best, but they're nothing like that. Yeah, my my best example that I always sort of loop back to whenever I try and explain the surveillance thing is uh, the Chinese government is openly doing what the U.S. government is denying it's doing <laughs> and then some. Yeah, it, it's weird the way they they spin hyper surveillance into a into a positive thing. A lot of stuff that would not fly anywhere else in the world. This is a really interesting phenomenon that is pretty much exclusive to China. First off, everybody, everybody, everybody has a phone. Like littlest kids to the oldest dudes have mobile phones, which I guess is not that uncommon anymore. But you know, everybody has one of two apps, and most of the time, both. Like every human being on the chinese mainland they are alipay uh, also known as jifabao and wechat which is the one that most people have heard of right those effectively do everything you ever need to do it, it sounds like i'm pitching it but it's more dystopian than you'd expect you know i can open my phone uh, I open that app and I can pay people. I'm able to get paid. I'm able to like transfer money to my bank. I'm able to like get travel tickets. I can watch movie reviews. I can order like my groceries. I can do pretty much anything centralized in one app. There's like Uber in there, not Uber, but the Chinese Uber and then the Chinese Uber Eats. And then I can like order stuff off Taobao slash Amazon. It's like everything you would ever need to do is centralized in one app. All the COVID stuff too. So if I want to like, you know, if I want to go into a movie, movie theater i gotta scroll past like my legal residency all the information that's pretty much ever existed about me centralized on one app and just like show the door guy uh, just a code you become a qr code in here because there's so many people in china that effectively you are you know there's that that joke that like oh yeah to the government you're just a statistic but you really are you have another app that does the same shit but kind of different and it's pretty much the same thing so i have two apps that know everything about me ever i haven't touched cash in like two years wow like anything to do with money is on your phone you can walk into like the most hole in the wall store you can walk into like you know any tiny mom and pop shop and they have a qr code 
And so you like, you know, you take your like a chocolate bar or whatever, put it on the counter, they scan it, they punch some numbers into a machine, and then they point at the QR code. I'm, I'd assume they say things to you, but I also don't speak Chinese. So they just, they see how white I am and they just go, I'm just going to point for this guy. And then they point at <laughs> a QR code. And, you know, I take out my phone, I scan the QR, the QR code, and I just assume that my phone has paid them so it's not like cash app it's not like small sums of money like i've i've paid like six hundred dollars worth of stuff on my phone oh, I, that's probably not that much to most people but to me it is <laughs> another major culture shock thing for me was uh just the amount of police everywhere i explained it to one of my friends uh back in canada as uh like dark souls enemies which sounds bad but <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's the most, the most apt comparison is Dark Souls enemies because there's cops everywhere, but there's different like tiers of cops, right? You have like the 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 bottom guys, which are almost always they call Bowan. It's security, and es- essentially they wear like this black outfit and they just have like this hat, and it's almost always just old dudes that sit at the gates of buildings. There's usually like one at every intersection, and they just sit there. They have like a radio. Sometimes they don't even have a radio. Their main job is to yell at you if you do the wrong thing. So, you know, if you like cross the street when you're not supposed to, there's mall cops, but everywhere. Uh. It's everywhere cops. It's like Paul Blart's wet dream. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Then above that, you have like the traffic cops. These guys have like little scooters and they wear black pants and a white shirt. And they usually have a baton as well as a radio. And these guys are actually hired by the police. The other guys are like hired by regional governments. These guys are hired by the police department. And uh, they also basically just yell at you, but they're more in more populated areas. Sometimes if you're lucky, they'll direct traffic. The rest of their job is just kind of standing around and going like, hey, You can't do that. It's, again, just pretty much just old dudes. I assume they just, like, you know how, like, Walmart hires retirees to be greeters? I think the government just hires old dudes to, like, yell at teenagers. (laughs) And then the tier above that, these guys are more uncommon. Uh, These are, like, police police. They look like, I don't know, American police, but they look like Canadian cops. You know, they look like what you'd expect a cop to look like. They have, like, the vest, and uh, they drive squad cars. And these guys can actually do things to you. They have the baton taser, all the all the tech and stuff. They don't have guns because there's like no guns here. My only interaction with them is I had been driving my scooter for like eight kilometers on a highway that you're not supposed to drive scooters on. And I don't speak Chinese, so the traffic cop had to call this guy to come yell at me. You know, that was my fault. The interesting thing about those guys is they um they have like okay, a ritual sounds weird. Uh, but every morning you can like sometimes hear them if you go by a police station they like they go to the police station and they all like line up like in ranks uh they grab like riot shields and bang them with sticks and yell what not hell? like a battle cry but i assume they're doing like a call and response thing it's really trippy when you hear it because you know it's like some hunger games shit you walk past a police station and you see like 40 dudes screaming and then above that is when I started, where like it's the thing that really made me go like, oh, I am in a police state. Is I was like walking to my girlfriend's house, right, and I just see, like, imagine a scary cop black van with the antennas. I saw that. It was a giant black Mercedes van with the windows pitch black and like sonar antennas and everything on top of it just parked in an intersection and along the rim of it is like 20 cameras in every conceivable angle that's when you really notice like oh big brother is here i don't want to make a the the quintessential 1984 reference that every angry old white guy in the u.s makes but you know it is that and then above that you have like you know the secret police They're dressed in all black. They technically don't exist. They definitely exist. Those are the guys that are in like, (laughs) those are the guys that are are in the no-no vans. So that sounds terrifying. What about the response to the pandemic? Because I'm guessing it all got worse after that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you may have seen it in the news. I live in Shanghai. If you've seen the news recently, it's that one. It's the one where we've been in lockdown for two months and like in the really inner city region, People have been locked down for so long and so harshly that people have genuinely starved to death. It's 
really, really intense. And it's insane once you hear the numbers because, you know, I, I hear about like where I'm from in Canada and they're like, hey, new record. We only got 500 new cases today. But like we went into lockdown at 500 cases total. Obviously, conspiracy theory is it's like a system of control. But effectively speaking, they don't want more COVID and they're willing to take any hit that comes with it. We got locked down pretty much sort of like late March. And, you know, in the beginning, they told us like, you know, oh, it's only going to be a four day lockdown. And then, you know, here we are basically three months later. We're essentially told, OK, so the way that Shanghai is organized is, well, I mean, they're called compounds, I guess, in American is the better English. In English is the best translation. It's basically a lot of the the areas is you have like main highways and then off of those you have uh, like a usually a road with a gate and then apartment buildings. Like commie blocks. Kind of, uh, but they're not like the commie block buildings that you'd expect. They're regular buildings. Mm. But they are effectively commie blocks with the gates and they stuff. They are communes? <laughs> I, I mean, with 30 million people in it, yeah. Jesus. First, they told us, okay, you have to stay in your compound. And so we're like, okay, whatever. So we go to our houses. We do that. Four days goes by. And then it's just like, oh, they're not letting us out. We can't leave. And then so that we, we hear from like the news and whatnot that, um, yeah, they're extending the lockdown indefinitely. And so it's like, OK, well, shit, you know, you know, we were fine because we have food um, in like storage, not like prepper style, but we have cans of pasta and shit. Uh, after that, after we got that news, they told us, OK, you have to stay in your house. And so then you're essentially stuck in your house for a long time. And we hear on the news like. You know, we hear burgeoning of like, oh, they're going to open next week. And then next week comes around and we're not open. And then what I remember hearing, I think the thing that like struck me the most is after several weeks of being told like, you know, oh, guys, don't worry, you get out next week. We hear like, oh, yeah, 10,000 troops from the military have rolled in to try and stop people from trying to leave their house. And that's kind of really when it hits when you're like, oh shit you know we're stuck here for a while so then after that you just you're you're stuck in your house for weeks on end i mean i was doing school online already but then everything 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 shuts down um i remember a few weeks after the the military rolled in the compounds started doing these things called group deliveries which is basically if you like gather the people from your compound you can order like 40 bags of specific food you know like you communicate with all your with all the people in your company you go okay guys like we're going to order this much and then they send like a big truck and they bring that the alternative if you're lucky enough to to have that is that aside from that the government is giving you quote unquote food deliveries right which is you we would get it about once a week but it was like shaky when it would arrive or if it would arrive at all so it's essentially a cardboard box with whatever food they decided to give you that time and it was really poorly organized ideally you're supposed to receive like you know meat bread rice fruits and veggies but you know there was one week where my compound was just delivered like 40 bags of banana 40 bags of bananas it's it's really like Jesus. Th- everyone's scrambling they're just trying to like put out as much food as they can um and they just don't i guess i don't know it's a lot of red tape i assume i heard like people got like you know a can of spam for households of like four to five people for like a week it's 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 really not ideal conditions i guess when things started slowly reopening after you know weeks of effectively being starved we were uh, thankfully enough me and the people i was close to were fine but you could see on the news people more in town were like trying to force them force their way out i heard that the suicide rate like increased incredibly because you know people were essentially devoid of resources And, you know, some buildings didn't have running water and you can't like the plumbers can't leave their houses to come fix your stuff. So you're just stuck. If anything breaks, it's broken. After weeks of that, we kind of got like our first hint of reopening, which would be um, if you're in a green zone. So that means your region, your like regional subdistrict within the city had zero cases from the beginning to now. Then you were allowed to leave between 2 and 5 p.m., one person per house. Jesus. Yeah, no, it's insane. One of those times that we were allowed to leave, I was the one who got out. So I was like, I was driving around up and down the road, and it is 
empty. Like, you know, you see all those pictures online of, you know, oh, it's China. It's like roads packed with people, packed with cars. It's like densely populated as hell. And then I'm just going up and down this road and I like I can do I think it's the first time in two years that I'd been able to like do a full 360 and not see a human being. It's insane. I say that a lot. But um <laughs> It's 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 genuinely just an astonishing moment to not see people for the first time in years. It genuinely felt like the apocalypse because there was like piles of garbage because the garbage hadn't really been collected in certain areas. There was like feral cats on the streets and feral animals on the streets because there was no humans to keep them in check. It felt like uh, 28 days later. And then I remember because, you know, your your district is allowed to leave, but you have to stay within your district. And so because of that, I was going down the road. And I decided to see, like, okay, what is technically stopping me from, like, driving to the middle of the city or whatever? Because, you know, I have great ideas. <laughs> you know, pushing the buttons of this massive government that's kept me locked in my house for several weeks. Let's see how far they'll let me go. So I drive down the road, and I eventually see just this wall of blue. And I'm like, oh, what's that? Maybe it's like a construction fence. Maybe it's a detour. And I go, and it's these big blue barricades that it it looked like something that you'd see at like a riot that like protesters put up. It's like these b- blue barricades, and then in front of it is like the barricades are like stuck together with like wire fencing and like barrels and just kind of it's just a pile of stuff to stop you from crossing into the next district. And you go there. And it just, you look down and it just goes for a long time. I don't quite understand the infrastructure that must be required to sort of like hold people like cattle effectively to just keep them in a place so effectively. Another thing that I guess struck me when I got out was for obviously to make sure nobody was outside is the the cops, the Dark Souls enemies had been allowed to you know, drive around or be outside this whole time. And I remember seeing like five cop cars lined up just on the side of the road, which is rare because like I said, the the cops here don't really drive cars. And so there was like five cop cars lined up and they were just chilling because they're, you know, nobody's going to try and leave. You know what this government does to people. Nobody was going to test it except me because my my prefrontal lobe probably wasn't developed great. (laughs) But, um... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and these guys were just chilling. And it reminded me of that one Top Gear episode where there was the ghost cities and they just drag race the cops because the cops don't have anything to do. And so you see these people that like have been essentially hired by this government to wrangle human beings. And for the first time since pretty much the history of China, maybe not the history of China, I'm exaggerating, but for the first time in a long time, these police officers just don't have anything to do. You can see they're like leaned up against the cars like you know cops cop show style and they're just kind of talking it's a trippy feeling that first time when like you know you know that it would be illegal to leave for a long time and then you kind of drive past the cops and it's that feeling when you're on the highway and you see a cop and you know you're going the speed limit but you still get that feeling of like oh shit what if he pulls me over it was that magnified with the power of Tiananmen Square. You know, yeah, nothing no, anybody it. was doing was at all to that degree, but it was magnified by just the, it definitely feels like I should not be allowed to be doing this. It feels strange to think that like billions of people have effectively had this way of thinking, I guess, bred into them. That sounds weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> have this way of thinking, like sort of ingrained into them that, you know, yeah, this you know there there is cops everywhere there is cameras everywhere you just do what they tell you i've said this a lot but it feels genuinely dystopian a lot of the media in the united states gets a lot of things wrong about china especially in like how totalitarian it is but for that first time since i got here and you know bear in mind i'm a i'm a staunch post-left anarchist i'm not a fan of the government regardless of what country it is but for the first time since I had essentially gotten here to China, because I got here and I was like, huh, I mean, it's not as bad as like people say. For the first time in such like a long time, I'd realized like I felt like your 65 year old uncle on Facebook with the selfie in the truck and the glasses being like, these damn, these damn media, they're going to turn this into China where you can't go outside for several months on end. But it was true. You know, it felt strange to, to kind of, to feel the, (laughs) I sound like a propaganda TV show. 
I say might in a negative way. It felt strange to feel the might of the Communist Party. It felt strange to just be like, you know, to be an ant in this kind of ecosystem of politics a lot of people on the left like far left actually kind of like i think they call them tankies are like the people that justify like the chinese and russian government's actions even though just because they're not america like what do you think of that oh boy uh you've opened a can of worms but um (laughs) essentially this is this is a kind of a I mean, it's leftist infighting, but in my eyes, it's justified. Tankies is the, 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 the correct term, you know. A lot of the, the more libertarian side of leftism, so that's to say anarchism, sort of like democratic socialism, that kind of stuff, there was kind of a rift that happened a bit before the Second World War, but especially after the Second World War and during the Cold War. During the Cold War and kind of post-Red Scare, there was this rift that happened. So this is more like the far left, not like the progressive left that we think of today. Yeah. Um, and even then, in terms of far left, Left, it's that uh, it's the it's the authoritarian side of the scale. Those who idealized the workings of Marx and that kind of stuff, specifically Lenin's stuff. So those who sort of believed in the USSR after the Second World War and during the Cold War, it kind of split because people realized, oh, you know, maybe the utopia that we had all been working for is now corrupt, right? People realized, hey, the USSR is effectively a totalitarian state. And that's when you got that rift where you realize people are, uh, where you, you kind of ended up with that rift of, I'm speaking with bias here, which is impossible to remove because, you know, I'm a human being. But you have these people that effectively believed, okay, we should, you know, abandon ship. The USSR and communist China are not leftism anymore. They've become totalitarianism. And then from there, you also ended up with the people that, at least in my eyes, were so ingrained in that way of thinking that they were not yet disillusioned or they were not ever disillusioned. There's that side of leftism that sort of believes in the ideas of leftism and then those that believed in the, uh, I guess, the interpretations of leftism. Yeah, like the states that were available that said they were leftist at the time. Yeah, pretty much. You have people that follow the ideas and people that follow the states. I guess as an anarchist, you know, I definitely lean towards the side, not lean, I'm all the way down towards the side of um, communist China and the USSR are a failed state. Not a failed state in the geopolitical sense, but in terms of, uh, I guess, leftist doctrine. Yeah. I'm glad that we're putting this at the end of the video because, like, otherwise people are going to get pissy at me. Like, the people that watch the oh, start yeah, and they're going to be like, you goddamn commie. <laughs> I am saying my things. If you feel like getting mad at me, get mad at me. Send me the death threats. I've already heard them. Uh, You know, don't get pissed in the comments after this guy. I appreciate it. And it's really interesting to hear someone (laughs) who understands the theory that that China is claiming that they know talk about how, hey, this is fucking terrifying either way. Like, it's still scary. Yeah. And even then, I don't believe in what china claims to believe in the first place and even then i'm able to sort of see past the veil of like hey this is not what we're supposed to be doing do they believe in like, did you, did you read the book like is that their thing oh um supposedly you know quote unquote yeah yeah personally i believe in post-left anarchism which is a very niche and a very radical side of anarchism that just believes that i won't give you this annoying like super long spiel but i guess i should probably clarify the common misconception that i've had to explain this like hundreds of times at this point but the idea that anarchism means absolute chaos and the absence of rules is at its core untrue i'm talking to you um (laughs) the concept that anarchy means complete chaos and that those who believe in anarchism just want you know the world to burn is intrinsically false and if you were to look into the actual theories behind it you would see that this is neither what we are attempting to complete nor what we have ever attempted to complete Uh anarchism at least the most common way to go about it believes in liberation for all people regardless of anything through the the direction of class warfare and direct action against a centralized state Uh, which is a bunch of fancy ways to say we don't want people to be starving to death because some guy wants to make money so it's like the opposite of totalitarianism effectively yeah it believes i say it believes because my beliefs are a bit more fringe and out there i'm 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 gonna get you know people on the right mad at me in the comments and now i'm gonna get maybe anarchists mad at me in the comments for not giving the correct interpretation but here's 
at least my perspective and my beliefs as to what the most, I guess, general interpretation of anarchism is, uh, it's the belief that the power of the state should be greatly reduced. So at most, it should be government, not in the form of nations, but governments in the form of maybe like towns or cities or smaller subdistricts like that, that are able to act independently and that integrate elements of direct democracy in order to sort of go about decision making. So that, that would be voting in the sense that everybody's vote counts for one or everybody's vote is equal. And obviously that's, e that's easier to do when you have a smaller area. I identify myself as an insurrectionist, which basically believes that that sort of, I guess, school of thought believes that, you know, we've expended all the other options. Anarchism has existed for hundreds of years and, you know, the revolution is not coming and therefore liberation should be achieved through uh, repeated, undying, and continuous rebellion, I guess, in any form. Okay, you've had your chance to explain post-left anarchism. It was actually interesting, but I can't let you go any further because people are going to think I'm giving you propaganda time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, okay, true. <laughs> These are my opinions, not his. I'm, uh, I'm, I, I'm just kind of a massive nerd. And you know what? Um, I appreciate it. And thank yeah. you for talking about this. It's been really interesting to hear about what China's hey. been doing. Yeah.